Welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. My name is Russell Leeds. And I'm Ricky Mandel. And this week, we're going to be talking about the secret strategies for finding off-market deals. Now, a lot of people talk about off-market deals, and it's kind of seen as a bit of a quite an exciting thing. Do you want to just explain the difference, Rick, between off-market and on-market deals? Yeah, so an on-market deal is a property deal that is being marketed to the public. So you can find on-market deals online, and, and it's being advertised to the public. So you can jump onto Rightmove, and if you see a property on Rightmove, then that is an on-market deal because it's being marketed. An off-market deal is a deal that you wouldn't find in the public eye. So it wouldn't be on right move, it wouldn't be online, and it's nowhere to be seen. You have to come off of the marketplace to find these types of deals. All right, so why are people so excited about off-market deals? Like, what, why is there such a buzz about off-market deals? What, what are the pros and cons? Okay, so one of the pros to an off-market deal is there's no agency involved off, uh, a lot of the times because you're going direct to the landlord. So if it's off market, there's no agency actually advertising it. And that means that sometimes if you're speaking directly to the landlord, you've got more room for negotiations because you're speaking to the person that's actually selling the property. Okay. You're not speaking to someone that's going to be getting a fee for the higher price that they get. Yeah, okay. And um, what are the cons? Um, well, it can be, you have to know where to look. Yeah. You, you you have to be good at negotiating. You have to know how to work with landlords and speak to landlords. And it's not when it's on market. It's a case of you speak to the agent, you put your offer forward, job's done. Off market can be slightly more tricky. I suppose one of the big cons with most off market sites is it's not for sale. Of course. Right? So you're, oh, yeah. you're trying to deal with people who aren't necessarily trying to it's sell their property. Like, it's almost like when you approach them, it's almost like you're you're going to be cold calling. Yeah. Which, Which makes it harder. Yeah. Because if you're dealing with an on-market deal, it means that they're actively trying to sell it. Yeah. And you've got an active seller. It's always hard when, you, when you're approaching off-market deals, trying to, you know, how you gauge it and how you, you, you can convince them, I suppose, to, to sell you the deal. Yeah. Because if it's for sale, it's probably on market. Yeah, of course. I mean, if someone's looking to sell their, their property, then the first thing they'll do is put it on the market. If you're not looking to sell, then why would you put it on? Yeah. So then it makes it a bit awkward then because you're reaching out to people that haven't had, or they, maybe they do, we don't know, because sometimes they do, but they haven't got necessarily the intention of selling their house because otherwise they would have put it online. Yeah, but the advantage of off-market is quite often you're going to get a really juicy deal. Yeah. Because the second it goes on market, you've got other people involved. There's a lot of demand. You can get outbid. You yeah. can get other people going in and viewing it. If it's just you dealing directly with a, a landowner or a, or a property owner and it's not on the market, you can potentially get an amazing deal, right? Absolutely. All Absolutely. right. So in which case, you sounded very brummy then. Absolutely. <laughs> Did I? Yeah, I, I thought so. <laughs> oh, well. You can watch it back. And, uh, well, yeah, I, I will. I will. Um, so if you're looking for off-market deals and you think, okay, this is probably a good strategy for me because I want to get a really juicy deal, I want to get a, a BMV, a below market value deal, or I want to yeah. get a piece of land because, I mean, land, I, I am very interested in buying land yeah. as a property developer. And what I always find is as soon as a deal goes on the right move, as soon as you've got an on-market deal with land, the price just goes ridiculous. Yeah, Like very, very rarely can you get an on-market deal with land where it actually stacks up as a developer. Yeah. And the reason is that is because of the competition. Because you've got people like builders that are interested. And, and when a builder buys a plot of land, they're not bothered about making the development markup because they're making the markup on the build itself. Yeah. It's like free work for them. It's like giving them work, yeah. right? Um, so land is really, really hard to get good deals on market. So you have to go off market. So if you're going to go off market, you're looking for off market deals, where would you go? Where would you look to find these deals? It's a good question, because where, where, that's a big question, isn't it? If they're off market, where do you go? Well, one of the first places that you can go to is you can network, do some networking. So I know um, a lot of people, in fact, a lot of people that come to our events yeah. are, are landlords and they're looking to offload portfolios. So networking events are uh, one of my top ones. Speaking with people, putting yourself in the, in the right rooms where there are gonna be landlords that have properties, their portfolio landlords, and simply asking them the questions and finding out what they want, what they need. You know, are they looking to offload, in the, even potentially in the future? Because here's another good thing about networking. When you've got a toolbox of strategies, 
what you could potentially do is you can go network and speak to a landlord. And sometimes I've come across landlords that are in their 50s and they're thinking of retiring in 10 years' time. Mm. And when they, in 10 years' time, they're looking to sell their properties, it's screaming out lease option agreements. Yeah. Because I could take it off your hands for the next 10 years and then I'll buy it in 10 years when you want to retire. If that's the plan anyway. Yeah. It often works like that as well with people that have got a portfolio they're trying to sell off, but they don't want to sell all of them in once for tax purposes. Yeah. So they yeah. want to sell them off slowly. Yeah. Like, oh, we want to sell one this year, one next year. You can target those sort of people for lease options and yeah. stuff as well. You can. Actually, I mean, we're at one of our events today and I actually had someone approach me with a deal. They said, look, I bought this land. Uh, the planning on it lapsed. I had to get planning permission again. I was thinking of putting it with an agent, but I'm kind of unsure what to do. Do you mind having a look at it for me? And he's very interested in either selling it to me, or if I'm interested, haven't probably looked at it yet, but selling it to me or partnering with him and I can help pay for the development, et cetera, and then split the profits at the end. So that is an off-market deal. Yeah. Now, if I'd waited or if he didn't approach me, he probably will put that on the market soon. So if you can catch people at networking events that are thinking of selling, yeah. that's definitely, definitely a way in. Yeah, and but, also people that come to network events sometimes, they you don't know what people's positions are, you don't know what their situations are, and sometimes they'll come to events um, and they'll, they'll come to networking events to find out some ideas of what they can do, and then they'll bump into people like us that have got a good solution for them as well, and we can help them buy it, and or even package and sell deals. Yeah. We often package and sell a lot of off-market deals to investors from, from networking. And you, you get a lot of off-market deals from agents as well, don't you? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Once you've got, once you've got, if you're doing deal sourcing, once you've got your foot in the door, especially with deal sourcing, and if you're buying yourself, it's the same principle. But once you get your foot in the door of an agency and they know what you're looking for, what type of investor you are, and you um, act quick with them, and you do as you say you're going to do, they'll often just keep giving you deals because they'll they'll realise that you can sell it or buy it quicker than they could. Yeah, now you, I know what you're probably thinking, well, if it's for an agent, it's not off market. But these are deals that an agent's about to put on the market, but yeah. because agents, I mean, I love agents, but agents can be a little bit lazy, would you agree? Well, I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're an agent and you get a deal land on your lap on a Thursday evening, or a Thursday evening. Does it have to be a Thursday evening? Well, I'll get to the point in a moment. Right. <laughs> I'll get wait for it. You'll, right. you'll like this one. They get it on a Thursday evening. Yeah. They're about to wrap up. They're shuffling their papers. It's five to five. Like they're on the news or something. Yeah, so it's like five to five. Right, yeah. The music comes on and they go, right, that time, shuffle the papers, tuck in the chair, and it's been five. And then the deal lands on their lap. They'll look at it on the Friday, mm. but then they won't put it on on the Friday. They'll put it on on the following Monday once they've looked through it all and sorted it all out. So... Technically, until that deal is on right move to the public, that's still an off-market deal. Yeah. And we have agencies that come to us saying, hey, look, we're about to put this property on. It's going live in three days' time. Are you interested? This and is it what saves them the hassle. If they can give it to yeah. you beforehand, it saves them the hassle. And so you can get in with agents by networking, right? Absolutely. Um, what, what, what sort of places then would you recommend go? If someone was here in the UK and they're looking to find off-market deals and thought, all right, networking sounds good for me. Have you got any top tips Top tips for networking for off-market deals. My top tips for networking for off-market deals is to sim firstly put yourself in the right room. So go to you know we 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 have t we we do events every single month. We do multiple events, and our events it's a property investors event. So who do you think is going to be there? <laughs> Property investors. Also, another good one is business networking events because what you'll find is with business networking events, you've got business owners that are really busy. They haven't got the time to deal with a lot of things. But because they own businesses, they often have a lot of money that they've invested into houses. Yeah. So um, I do. I go to them types of events and then I just simply ask questions. That's my number one tip is to ask people questions when you're network networking. Don't tell people about yourself and make it all about you. You want to find out everything about them. How can you help them? What do they need? What do they want? What's their problem at the moment? And how can you solve their problem? And it may be that you don't actually benefit financially from solving their problem. Mm. However, when you help someone, I believe it comes around full circle. Yeah, also, People aren't interested, everyone's interested in helping themselves, right? Yeah. So if you're looking for, if you find someone that happens to have a house that they're looking to sell, from their point of view, it's helping them. But from your point of view, you're looking for an off market deal, it helps you. Yeah. But if you go around networking and you're just shoving, oh, do you have any off market deals? Because I'm looking for off market deals. You become that annoying person Absolutely. that just goes around pushing your own stuff. So also, I yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I just thought of another idea as well. Go on, yeah, go ahead. When Better be good though if you're going to interrupt me. Um, 
It will be good because okay. I'm, 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 I've thought of it. Go on. So, uh, so I love that they laughed at that. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky would be and, good. And, and, and just for the record as yeah. well, I didn't before we started. I absolutely did not tell everyone in the room to laugh, even if it wasn't funny. I didn't tell them to do that. <laughs> no, um, but with networking as well, mm. you want to get people coming to you, and one of the great ways to do that not uh, not only networking but also direct mailing people. Mm. So you know, you're putting yourself out there and, and reaching out to people saying how you can help them maybe it could be I know, I, like one of the things that samuel teaches is to you know reach out to people directly and say to them you can you can buy their house if they're interested in selling if you're interested in selling i can buy your house quickly mm. and and that's that's the fact that's the truth we can we can do it as a below market value offer if you're looking for a quick sale but you're reaching out to people and if you send enough letters or you do enough direct marketing the, the stats show if you send 100 letters or you, you reach out to 100 people 10 of those are likely to reach back with interest, and out of, out of ten people, you're likely to get a deal. Yeah, yeah, I agree. In fact, as I talked about earlier, sort of looking for land, letters is the main way that we get off market deals. Yeah, you it's, send a lot of letters for your land, don't you? We we, we send well, quite a lot. We send about hundred letters a week. So what we're doing is we're targeting sites that we believe could get planning permission. Are all of your land deals from uh, off market? Uh, not all of them, because some sometimes we get we we mm, I'm saying that, but pretty much actually, yeah. There, there's been the occasional one that we've bought through uh, through an agent, but pretty much all of it is. Because another thing, I know that you, I, I know one of your land deals. I remember you telling me the story that you were on a walk with Samuel, and you saw a piece of land, and you mm. just found the owner, and you reached out to the owner. It wasn't for sale or anything. You just reached out to them. That, 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 I mean, when, you, when you're doing letters, one of the ways to find land is by driving around. Yeah. You can drive around, you can walk around. When you, when you, when you know what you're looking for, do you know that there's always that, um, people always talk about, do you know when you're getting a new car? Yeah. Like, what, was, what was the latest car that you bought? Uh, G-Wagon. A G-Wagon, black G-Wagon, right? Yeah. So when you bought your black G-Wagon, I bet you used to think that G-Wagons were really rare. I, I, I think I saw a few on ever. the road. Yeah. Yeah, hardly ever, right? But when you bought it, or just before, when you decided you were going to buy it, did you suddenly start spotting every, them everywhere? Every other car on the motorway now yeah. is a G-Wagon. It's because we drive around together. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you've got a G-Wagon as well. We're like yeah. G-Wagon friends. Oh, that doesn't sound <laughs> right. <laughs> friends, G-Wagon friends. No, um, but you suddenly start seeing them. Now, were they there before? Yes, yeah. but now you start seeing them because your eyes have been opened because uh, to the G-Wagon. Because most when, when we're focusing on stuff, most of the stuff we focus on, we don't actually see. We had that test, didn't we? We went out for that work, um, work do with some of the guys, and we were like, right, close your eyes, Rick. What are we all wearing? And you had no clue. Yeah. Right, because even though you've seen us, you saw what we're wearing, you don't, you don't take it in, you don't remember it. Yeah. And it's the same with property deals. When you know what sort of land or know what sort of properties, abandoned buildings, things like that that you're looking for, and you start driving around, you've got it in your mind, suddenly you start seeing these opportunities. Or even like, like I said, me and Sammy were walking when we saw one, you start seeing these opportunities kind of as you go, and it's like, ah, that's a good opportunity. Get your smartphone out, take a photograph, um, brilliant, there's a potential letter yeah. that we could send. Yeah. So absolutely. yeah, drive it around. I, I, networking is a big one, letters is a big one. Driving, drive-bys, not the shooting drive-bys. <laughs> In your G-Wagon, I bet it looks like that's what you do. Um, but drive-bys, 100%. Another big one, social media. How would you use social media? Well, what I do is, because I'm not really massive, massive on social media, um, and I don't think you have to be. I don't think you have to know the ins and outs of social media or exactly how it works. What I think you, you should... You don't even know how it works. Well, I know how it works, but what I'm saying is you don't have to know. Okay. You know, like when you came to me and you said, what's Facebook a few weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you don't have to know how to use it. But yeah. what I use it for is I just have my profile and then I, I kind of leverage off... I mean, I leverage off Samuel. A lot of people do a lot. Like he's got a Facebook group with over forty thousand members, mm. and if you position yourself in that Facebook group and not like you know spam it or, or but if you just give value into that Facebook group with forty thousand people, you're more likely going to end up speaking to an investor that has a portfolio that you can do business with. So it's not necessarily using social media to pump out loads of content and try and do this and try. I would just 
have a profile that's professional and then position that profile in front of investors. So like become part of communities, Facebook groups, yeah. forums, and just be a valued member of that forum. It could even be just going onto the Facebook groups and yeah. commenting on someone's post. Mm. Someone does it, like there's deals being posted in there all the time of, of students of ours that are posting keys and they've done this and it's like, just put a strong arm, like my arm's really strong, like you see this? Yeah, oh. That muscle, oh, just start, put one start, of them emojis start, on there. Don't touch it. Oh, just watch out. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. Anyway, so you can do one of those, those emojis, um, like a strong arm emoji. And the thing is, the more little things you do like that. Or give advice to them. A lot of people ask questions, don't they, on the forums. So if you go on and give advice, people are like, oh, that person knows what yeah. they're talking about. Maybe, you're a bit, maybe you are a builder and you've got experience with building works and someone asks a question about some sort of work that they're doing and they need help with some sort of building question. You can give value by answering their question. And in return, that gives you exposure and people will probably reach out to you. A lot of people undervalue their experience as well. They a do. Lot, a lot of people don't, you know, you say, oh, you know, what do I know? And it's like, hold on, you're an architect. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know you, you, you're a professional person, you've got experience in property. Yeah. You know, to, you know, it's, oh, I was speaking said, to someone the other day and they said to me, oh, I've not, I've not really done much in property. I, you know, I've got a few houses and I was like, okay, cool. So what's your kind of, how long have you had them? They said, oh, 10 years, but they've only got a few. They're making a few thousand pounds a month, but... And I was thinking, but you're, you're a landlord. I said, what's mm. the value of the houses? And they said, well, all together, you know, I mean, they've got mortgages, but all together they're worth about two and a half million. <laughs> and I was like, you are a property millionaire. And when you're speaking to people, you should be saying you're a property millionaire because that's the truth. A landlord you, for over 10 years, yeah. property millionaire. It's like, of course you've got value to give. Yeah. You've, been, you've had that experience for yeah. 10 years. You can go and help people on the groups. Yeah. And I agree, very much agree with what you're saying about not spamming people. Yeah. I think spamming people, you know, buy my stuff. Ah, yeah. yeah. Whether you're at networking, whether you're on social media, it just turns people off. Yeah, it does. It does. 100%. You like being turned on. <laughs> yeah, so I do not like spamming people. Sorry, that does yeah. Go ahead. Um, I lost my trailer thought. I can think of something else. I've got a horrible thought in my mind now of you. <laughs> um, go on, what's your, what, what's your other well, idea? Another thing you can do to find people, whether you're sending letters and stuff, and I know, again, I know you've done this quite a lot, is looking at like public records for like HMO yeah. lists and things like that yeah. to identify potential it's properties. Crazy. The amount of people that say to me, there's no, there's no leads out there, there's no HMO deals out there. If you go onto the council websites in your area and you search HMO register, it will come up with a public record of every single HMO that's licensed in that area. So what would you do with that list? A direct, you combine these strategies. Hmm. So di direct mailing can be combined with the HMO license. So what I would do is I'd download the HMO license register <coughs> and you'll get all of the information of the people that own the property and I'd direct mail them and I'd just say, hey, um, I saw you, you, you've got a HMO in this area. Um, if you're ever interested in selling or renting out the whole property, feel free to reach out to me. We've got rent to rents that way, and we've sold below market value deals that way by finding inve uh, investor landlords that have these deals and they're looking to offload them. We sell them to an investor and they buy below market value because it's a quick sale for cash. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. rent to rents as well. Using the same list? Yep. So you're just approaching the. Because there's landlords on the list that have HMOs that have void pit, they've got empty rooms. They're, everyone's got, we said earlier, everyone's got different problems. There's landlords that have HMOs, that have five bedroom HMOs and three of the rooms are empty and they're sick of it. And some of them, I'll tell you something interesting as well. It's going to be interesting. It is. I reached out to one person and they didn't even know they had the HMO. <laughs> they didn't even know. So they had a HMO? Yeah. That they purchased? They didn't know because they, they got it inherited and it kept on getting passed down and passed down and it just got left and left and left again and they didn't even know they had it and it's completely empty and I reached out to them. So they had a HMO that they didn't even know they had that was just sitting there empty? Yeah, because it had been passed down and, passed, and they didn't know and, they, and they, they don't live around here. They were just like, oh, I don't look into it and they looked into it and they're like, yeah, I actually did. I got it inherited. It got passed down. I've got this HMO. And then, anyway, we didn't that reminds me of that footballer. I can't remember who, I think it was, oh, I can't remember who it was, but he had a Porsche and he went to the airport in his Porsche parked it up, caught a plane, got back, forgot he'd driven there and caught a taxi home and just forgot he had a Porsche. <laughs> he, he just forgot for like six months. Is he was like, story? that's a true story. He was like, oh, oh yeah, I had a Porsche. I've got like six months worth of parking fines now. What the hell? 
Well, you say that, but this guy had a house that he didn't know about. And yeah, but the Porsche, he drove his Porsche to where he was going. And then he forgot he, he had a yeah, new but the Porsche. house. It's like if you get if you get passed down a house over generation a generation, it's like well, you, you, there is a potential possibility you might not realise you've got it. But if you drive your car the day after, you're not going to go. Oh shit! Well, it wasn't a day after. It was like a week. He went on holiday, and then he came back like a week after. And then he just caught a taxi home. He thought he, he forgot that he'd driven there, got a taxi home. And obviously he's got multiple. If you only had one car, I agree with you. You'd get home, you'd be like, shit, where's my car? Oh, I left it at the airport. Yeah, it is. But he'd obviously got multiple cars, so he just drove them How instead. How does that happen? I don't even forget when I put my coffee down. <laughs> I do. You don't forget your coffee? I forget. But sometimes, you know, you're sitting at work, you know, you're working at the computer or whatever, and you, you drink, oh, it's really cold now, I've had it there for hours. You don't ever do that? No, I drink it. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you're just a better person than me, then, aren't you? Well done, well done. Uh, but yeah, so that is, that is quite, I can't remember the point of your interest. Oh, I story. can't remember the point either. But ah, uh, HRO register. Yes. So did you get the deal? Which one? The one. <laughs> Which one? The one where he forgot he had the house. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> How could you not get that deal? He didn't even know he had it. Exactly, because when I, I helped him, I told, I told him he had it. I told him he had it, and then he realised, and when he looked into it, he was like, oh, brilliant, I'm going to rent it out. And you were like, you should do it through me. No, I didn't do that. Because I, I helped him rent it out, and in return, it, you know, maybe it'll pay me back another day. But I helped out someone I didn't know they had a HMO. Oh, aren't you a Robin Hood? Well, yeah, you would have, you would, what would you have done? Oh, let rent it through me. Oh, 100%. Really? What, what, why are you sending the letter in the first place? <laughs> no, but it's a different situation, because he didn't know he had it, I was helping him. I'm if he turned around and said to me, well, could you rent it for me? I would have said, yeah, of course. But he wanted to rent it himself. I would have said, look, man, you clearly don't know what you're doing. Yeah, but you buy, you, co you... You buy coffees and leave them on the table and wait for them to go cold. <laughs> well, this is true, this is true. So in, in sort of like summary then, off-market deals, great things about off-market deals is you can get really good deals. Yeah. Much better deals than you can if you go on market. You can get below market value. You can get like land that hasn't got planning that you can add value, buy refurbish your finance. If you're driving around, you can look for like abandoned buildings. I mean, like how often do you see an abandoned building now and you think, oh, I could convert that? They're absolutely, they're everywhere. But they are everywhere. Yeah. Um, so you can network, you can speak to estate agents, you can speak to other property investors. Uh, so there's loads of ways of getting off-market deals. Yeah. It's a bit more work. It's not as easy. The lazy, easy way is just to go to an agent. Yeah, but nothing in life is easy. Nothing, nothing good comes easy. It's true. If you want to get a really good deal, then you put in the work to find an off-market deal. Yeah, and how long, if someone was starting from scratch, it was, all right, I'm going to find an off-market deal, how long typically would you say it would take them if they started going networking, if they were doing... T you know, doing what we've just sort of suggested. What sort of times? I know, I know well, it's like saying, "How long is it?" Well, no, I mean, I mean, it, it, how long will it take them to find a deal? To, to secure a deal. To secure it, um, you could do it within a few days. I mean, the HMO register is instant. You could you send secure a, a deal in a few days. Potentially, yeah. Potentially, but how long do you think realistically? Maybe a, a week and a half, couple of weeks. Yeah, we're not talking a year here. Oh, no, I mean, I'm, no way. Well, maybe if you were doing it and just advising them that they rent it out themselves. <laughs> it might take you a year. But if you did it properly, you know, how I would do it, someone that would forget the cup of tea because they're, they're too engrossed in the work, not like you that's all worrying about it, you might get it done in, in a couple of weeks. You go around banging on people's doors. Oh, you're looking to sell. No, all right. <laughs> we'll be off market. We should add that to the list. Yeah, we add it to the list. Harassing people. <laughs> Brilliant. So I hope, guys, you found that useful. Uh, that's off-market deals. There's some top tips there on how to secure off-market deals. This is the Property Investors Podcast. We'll be back next week. My name is Russell Leeds. My name is Ricky Mandel. See you next week.